Oh, y'all not ready to have church. I said, high five somebody and tell them the blood still works. Come on, don't push me. Make it easy. Make it easy. Tell them it worked for my mama. Tell them it worked for my daddy. But tell them most importantly, I recognize that it works for me. Shall it works for me. This is how you know that it's real. If you don't have an organ in the house, you have an organ down on the inside of your soul where the music can churn late at night and say the blood still works. We're standing because of the blood. We're living because of the blood. We're breathing because of the blood. Oh, if we had time to talk about the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. If you only knew the power of the blood. The Bible says the life of every creature is in the blood. Glory to God. You give me a piece of your blood, I can find out everything there is to know about you. Your blood type, diseases you are susceptible to, what type of things that you have, things that run in your family, just because I have a piece of your blood. Y'all don't hear me here. The blood can speak. It talks on your behalf. It lets us know everything about you. This is why when Abel died, God says, I didn't hear a voice. He says, I hear his blood crying out from the ground. This is why every time you get in trouble, God says, I hear the blood of Jesus Christ crying out on their behalf. Now, I need you to shout like you know the blood has been speaking for you. Pleading for you. Get your Bibles. Let's go to the word of God. If you can stand for the word of God in reverence to God's word, respect to God's word, that would be a tremendous blessing to us. Something worth standing for in this time. Hallelujah. Heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of the Lord shall stand forever. Hallelujah. Thank God for the blood. The blood of Jesus blesses us with life, strength, and everything we need. I saw Mother Mabel Hughes sitting over there this morning. Is that you, Mother? I saw you and just said the blood. That's our church's oldest member, 103 years old. I'm not talking about the temperature. I'm talking about her age, 103 years old. Somebody say, a century looks good on you. Hallelujah. That's somebody that could testify. Kingdoms have passed away. I've seen leaders, dictators rise and fall. I bet she could testify. Wars have come. World War I, World War II. But one thing has remained the same. Oh, glory. Y'all don't want to have church here this morning. Y'all want to be cute on Easter. So let's get back to being cute. Okay. 
Luke chapter 24, and I want to read verses 1 through 8. As is my habit, for those of you who listen to me on a regular basis, I have one focal verse, but I want to read verses 1 through 8 to keep it in context. So let's go to the gospel of Luke. Hallelujah. The third and last of what's called the synoptic gospels. These three gospels are similar, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John serves another purpose, but nonetheless, I want to go to Luke. Luke is a little different because Luke is not a Jewish man. God stepped outside of the box with Dr. Luke. Amen. Just because you're saved doesn't mean you have to be poor. Come on, somebody. God is saving doctors, presidents, CEO, Fortune 100 leaders. And God breathes upon this man and Holy Spirit inspires him to write these words. They are the word of God, but nonetheless, they are written through a human agent. He is the pencil or the pen, so to speak, that God uses to bring the word of the Lord to us. Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 8. Amen. And God's word declares, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men, and clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Verse 5, in their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, watch this. Why do you look for the living among the dead? Perhaps you've heard that question a time or two as you've traversed through a Sunday school or small group experience, but I'm believing somebody is reading this for the first time. I'm happy that you're here. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man will be delivered over to the hand of sinners be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. If your Bible is like mine, those letters should have turned red at that point, symbolizing the words that were spoken by Jesus. Every now and then you get in trouble, you just need a reminder of what he said. Anybody just need a reminder? See, I don't come to you today with something fancy. I don't come to you with something brand new. I don't come to you with something clothed in the depths of systematic and biblical theology. I don't come to you as a biblical theologian or historian. I come to you with the same old story. It's just a reminder, the same old story that's been preached for 2,000 years. Every now and then, you just need a reminder when you're going through a test of what God has said. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day, be raised again. Watch this, verse number 8. Then they remembered his words. Let's go back up one more time to verse number five, our focal verse today. That question he asked, why do you look for the living among the dead? Why do you look for the living among the dead? They were going to a cemetery to look for a dead man. The angel asked them, why do you look for the living among the dead? Let's prayerfully consider this thought. The wrong place to look. The wrong place to look. The wrong place to look. Father, we declare that your word is blessed. It is exalted in our hearing, in our reading, and in our doing. Let all of God's people say amen. On your way to your seat, say the wrong place to look. The wrong place to look. 
Hallelujah. Take your rest and get comfortable. The wrong place to look. Our text this morning places us in the wee hours of the morning on Sunday. There are 13 recorded appearances of the resurrected Christ. 13 times Jesus appears to individuals, groups of people, disciples, apostles, women, men, 500 at one time, varying degrees of groups, down to up to 500, down to a single individual. There are 13 appearances of the resurrected Christ. Some go as far as eight, uh, as maybe even years or months away when he appears to the Apostle Paul in Acts 13. Some are 40 days away in Acts 1 where the Bible declares that Jesus presents himself to his followers. Then there are others where Jesus appears eight days later, a little over a week. But our text this morning places us in the wee hours of early Sunday morning. These are the first. This is the inaugural group of individuals who are getting ready to encounter the resurrected Christ. And we pick up and we read Luke 24 early in the morning. There's nothing like rising early in the morning. It was twilight. Perhaps the sky had a purple haze because night was slowly beginning to fade away. But at the same time, it had an orange hue because the sun was just getting ready to rise. It was an in-between time. Not enough day to be day yet, but not enough night to be fully night. It's in between. The twilight. Have you ever been in between somewhere? If y'all help me preach, give me two amens early, I promise I'm going to be out of your way. Just let me set the table and we're going to eat really fast. Is that okay? And so they're at twilight, stuck in between. Night is still present. But at the same time, morning is on the horizon. Have you ever been stuck in between? And, and I know what you're struggling with. It's, 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 it's not defined. It's nebulous. It's vague. It's indescript. It's ill-defined. You don't really know how to define it, but you know within the depths of your spirit when you're there, you're stuck in between. You're not quite out of where you were, but yet you're not into where you want to be. So you're stuck in between. You haven't yes got your yet got your feet tangled out of the sins of the past but yet something on the inside says there's something that's drawing me forward and if I can just get this thing off of my foot off of my leg off of my life for just a moment I could be everything that I see in my heart I can do everything that I dreamed about all that God has called and predestined me to do is waiting on me but I am stuck in between in between jobs in between relationships in between churches I just moved to the area in between cities I'm not yet out of where I was but I haven't yet got settled and comfortable into where I am so I'm stuck In between, in between, in between. Anybody, if we be honest today, finances are stuck in between. You're doing a little better than you were this time last year but you still got a budget when you go through the grocery store. You still got to have your cell phone out with your calculator because you can't get the bread without crust from Whole Foods this week because you're stuck. In between, there is nothing like being stuck in between. I haven't quite reached it, but but I can see it in my mind's eye, and I'm stuck in between. In between, this was just only supposed to be my opening point. Y'all pray me, this is not going good. This is not going, I can see how this happens. This is how this happens every week, but I'm going to get out of it, I promise 
stuck in between. And the thing that makes in between so haunting or so hard is you can see just enough of the other side, but you can't have it quite yet. Just enough to see what better looks like, but you can't quite attain it just yet. So you're stuck in between. And these group of ladies, these are ladies in this group, but nonetheless, the men will come later on. I'm speaking to everyone. These group of ladies are coming to put spices on the body of Jesus. And it is yet night. Day is on the horizon, but night is still present. And one of the things I love about God is God doesn't need daylight to work. God does his best work at night. If I had time to steal an old sermon, to go back through the annals and steal an old sermon from our leader, he preached a sermon years ago, says God works the night shift. You still remember that one? God, God does his best work at night. Night. They have no idea. They're stuck in between. It is night. It is dark. Day has not fully come yet, but they are not aware that God is already on the move. God has already been up to something. God has already done more than they could have ever imagined. Not when the sun rose, but yet in steel while it is night. If I had time and if I had anybody who listened to our Good Friday message, you know what I'm talking about. You can go back into God's files and look at some case studies about how God works at night. It was Paul and Silas who prayed at midnight. It was nighttime. And the Bible says an earthquake came because God works at night. God sent the spies to go into the land and stay there and see it overnight. I want you to look into what I have for you at night. If you do it in the daytime, there's a chance you could be seen and you could be killed. You don't want to risk it. So I'm going to expose you to it at night. God can expose you to things at night. Stop waiting for day for things to get better, for things to go a certain way for things to turn in your favor as you like to describe in order for you to give God glory in order for you to recognize that God moves because God does not have to wait till the sun rises God works at night for the Bible declares in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and it was void. And what does the Bible say? And darkness was over the surface of the deep. But somebody is there doing something and the spirit of God is hovering over the waters because God is working at night. He works in the you don't have to wait until the sun rises while you're laying on your pillow God is already working while you're praying about it at 9 p.m. God is already moving God works in the night And I want to talk to somebody. If you've ever gone through it, everybody in the room has been through some kind of trouble. But there is no kind of trouble like the trouble that haunts you at night. I've never had a tax like I have a tax when it comes into the night. God, if the enemy threw his best punch in the day, I would have no problem. But it's the tossing and turning at night. The sounds that you think you hear, the cries that you think you heard, the worries and the fears and the anxieties that overtake you at night. I've had so much trouble at night that I would purposely try to go to sleep during the day just so I can go to school, so I can stay awake at night. I'm talking about real trouble. You're trying to chase it away. I had some real trouble at night. Waking up to check my doors, waking up to check on my children because my mind couldn't find any rest. Have you ever had trouble at night? 
And I'm just waiting for you to take off your Easter clothes and let's just get real this morning. Pastor Gabriel, I came to church on Easter, but it's night in my life. I came wearing a fancy suit, but it's dark. I came wearing a church lady's hat, but it's dark. I can't see. It's nebulous. It's indescript. But I know it down within the core of my being. My life is in the middle of night. Yet and still, at twilight, at the wee hours of the morning, I'm on time, at the wee hours of the morning, while it is yet night, a group of women decide to move. And they make their way toward the tomb of Jesus. What I want you to see or not see, what I want you to get a feeling of is the trauma that these followers of Jesus have just endured. What I want you to get a sense of, their, 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 their so-called Messiah is dead. They heard the nails go into his wrists. They heard the nails grow through the bones in his feet. They heard him get stabbed in his side. And it is not that it just happens, but I can sure I can be sure in their minds they can still hear the sound. The sounds of what took place, not just the memory, but every now and then you can go back to the sounds. I told you all before, we almost lost our son at night. And every now and then I would be haunted because I would go to bed and I would swear I could hear him again gasping for his last breath. There's nothing like the sounds of the trauma that you have endured. Every now and then the sounds will come back. Sounds of gun fire and things that you have endured every now and then will play back in your head the sounds of that past relationship and that abuse the sound of that divorce and what the judge and what the lawyer sounded like and what he sounded like and what she sounded like whenever you were abused the sounds I can imagine are still ringing within their ears, within their heads, the sounds of Jesus, <laughs> the screams, the trauma, the ah, everything going back, the whip on his back, and they are still moving forward in the trauma. The trauma of Friday night. They heard the final cry, ah, my God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? What I want you to do is I don't want you to read the Bible and take away the emotion from the text. I want you to be able to read it and fully comprehend and understand. And we've heard the story for 2,000 years and for 30 plus years in my life and it can become common. But I don't want you to lose the feeling that the early followers of Jesus had at this point. This is not any ordinary death. This is seeing your leader Die in the most gruesome and humiliating way right in front of you. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. I lost about half of the room with that song right there. That's an old hymn that they used to sing. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? These women, it was not just a song for them. They were actually there. I never understood that song as a kid because I answered the question quickly. No, I was not there. It was 2,000 years ago. But for them, they could say, I was there. When they crucified my Lord, I saw it with my own eyes. And something that is often overlooked is at this point, none of this has any meaning. Don't you dare 
bring your Western 21st century theological mindset. We have the full revelation of God from Genesis to Revelation. We know how the story unfolds. We even know what's going to happen in the future. Whether we make it there or not is God's choice. But yet and still, we know how the story is going to end. There is no New Testament written yet. They are living out the words that you and I are now reading on the pages. So none of this has any meaning at this point. There is no idea or thinking of a savior of a Christ crucified for the sins of the world to being raised up and seated in heavenly places. Paul, none of that is even around yet. All of this has no meaning. Right now it's just a series of traumatic events. And like them, there can be many of us who can go through life and go through things and not recognize that life has meaning. It's not just them, even the male disciples. I, I preached that one year in John 21 when Jesus comes to Peter and the apostles with that, great, that second great catch of fish. This is the third time that Jesus had appeared to Peter and the disciples and yet and still they returned back to what they were doing. You would be surprised how many are going to go through this weekend, get up, get dressed, come to church on Easter, sit with their family, take a wonderful picture, have an Easter egg hunt at the house, Spend time with grandma, go to sleep, get up, go to work tomorrow, and none of this has any meaning. They don't apply it to anything. They don't live better. They don't, they don't see better. They don't walk in the power and the authority that it provides. It's just another day on the 2023 calendar. And at this point, it has no meaning. And so they go to the tomb of Jesus looking to put spices on a dead man. And these women get up first thing in the morning. And I used to tend to think that it was their devotion to Jesus and them being devout followers, their spiritual fervor that led them, and it, I'm sure it probably was, that was a part of it, but I tend to believe that it was something about the traumatic events of the weekend that woke them up. Because if you're truly in trouble, I mean in some real trouble, there's going to be no sleep. Have you ever had a trouble that causes you to not to sleep? It, they, 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 I'm sure they had hyper arousal. I, I'm sure they were very alert. I'm sure they were having symptoms at this point of PTSD. Any yell, any scream could probably make them jump. And I, I, I tend to think that it was not so much their devotion, but they said we might as well get up and go see Jesus because I'm not having any, any, any signs of sleep. So let's just get up and go to the place of our Lord. Because I can't sleep anyway. So you might as well just get up and go. I've had prayer times like that with God. And I would love to pat myself on the back and say I got up that early because I'm such a good saint. And I'm such a good Christian. And my discipline got me up that morning at 3, 4, and 5 a.m. To seek the Lord while he may be found. And call upon him while he is near. Early in the morning I sought the Lord. He heard my cry and delivered me from all of my troubles. But absolutely not. It was trouble that drives me up in the morning. Every now and then, God will allow the trouble to sit down on your life so you don't get up and seek his faith. God has the right kind of tailor-made trouble, and he'll let it sit down on you where you can't move, you can't go right, you can't go left, but the only thing you can do is whisper the name of Jesus. I got you talking to me now. You didn't want to talk to me before, but I know the right kind of trouble to get you to speak my name. 
I'll allow things to get hard. I'll allow things to get tough. I'll allow people to fall through just so you'll know that man will pass away, pass away but I'll still be here. People's attitudes toward you may change, but I am the Lord your God and I change not. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'll allow it. To show you who I am. So they couldn't sleep. And even if they could sleep, watch me here, there was no rest. Y'all better hear me here this morning. Are you with me here? There's a difference between sleep and rest. And even if they did get some sleep, they didn't have any rest. This is why Jesus never promised us sleep. He says, come unto me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. There are plenty of people around the world right now who can help you get sleep, but they can't help you get rest. There are all kinds of sleep aids. There's all kind of meditative music that you can play all night to help you to sleep. There's all types of yoga poses that will help you to sleep but have you ever woke up after eight hours of sleep and you still felt tired that's because you don't need sleep you need rest see y'all gonna get playing church with me here in just a moment you got eight hours of sleep but you still woke up heavy because you haven't entered his rest Rest is something that only Jesus can provide. He says you can only get that from me. You can't get that from a yoga guru. You can't get that from any meditative music. Only I have rest. And this is what our world needs now, rest. Not sleep, you need rest. So even if you only get four hours, you wake up and can say everything will be all right. When the lights are off, you can say, God will provide because I have rest. When she walked into the room and says, it's over. When he says, I'm leaving you tonight, you can yet and still have rest. And so even if they did get sleep, they didn't have any rest. Because the rest that Jesus was speaking of comes through a relationship with him. And at this point, he's gone. Come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But there is no rest for the weary. And they wake up in the twilight hours of the early morning. And they go down to the tomb to put spices on a dead man. And what I love is there's no indication from these people that anything special is going to happen today. They didn't wake up saying we're going to go encounter an angel they didn't wake up saying we're going to go encounter a risen Savior. They didn't wake up saying today we're going to see our crucified Lord raised to life. They didn't wake up saying today we're going to be trailblazers and history makers. We're going to be the first ones to proclaim the gospel message that Jesus is alive. They just woke up doing the mundane, ordinary things. Just a devout task to go honor their leader. Oh, y'all don't hear me here. I've preached on this before, and we skip over the ordinary, the mundane. We always try to arrest God and put him down on a specific date, on a specific time that we know he's going to move. It's Passover. It's Easter Sunday. It's Christmas. It's an anniversary time. God's going to do it on my birthday. By the time I'm 38, there is no indication that God is going to do anything, but they are just getting up, going down to the tomb 
womb, not recognizing that they're getting ready to have an encounter with God most high. I want to talk to somebody this morning and I declare over your life that you are getting ready to have an encounter with God most high. See, I'm not worried about this right now because this is when everybody assumes that God is about to show up Easter Sunday morning when we're dressed and when we're awake. But I speak and declare that this word is going to come haunt you on Thursday night. Goodness and mercy is going to have a chase down and catch up with you on Friday morning. Tuesday afternoon, the words that the Lord has spoken is going to come to your mind as a reminder. God has a way of working when you least expect it. Will you slap somebody front, back, left, side to side and tell them God is up to something? Do you not see it? Do you not perceive it? Stop waiting for a sign in the sky. God is up to something. Just do what you're going to do. Stick with your spiritual disciplines. But somewhere in the middle of it, God has a way of stepping in and say, now I'm going to show myself mighty and I'm going to show myself strong. So they come down, and there's no indication that this is going to be a different day. And when they get there, there are three surprises. Number one, the stone is rolled away. Number two, there's nobody inside. And number three, there are two men standing next to them that are angels. Three surprises meet these ladies on the way. As they arrive there, the stone is rolled away. Nobody is inside. And angels are yet and still standing there right beside them. God has a way of doing what you least expected. What I love about them is they didn't allow the limitations to stop them from going. They didn't allow the physical limitations to stop them from going. They could have stayed home. It's not in Luke's account, but it's in another gospel account where they have the conversation. They are conversing, saying, who shall roll away the stone? They, they, they don't allow the limitation to stop them from doing what they want to go do. They just went down there anyway. And by the time they got there, the problem that they thought was there was not there any more. I believe that's easy preaching. You could be able to preach that to your neighbor yourself. Tell them just get down there anyway. Go anyway. Slap them and say go anyway. Go if your family doesn't go. Go if your sister don't go. Go if your cousin don't go. Go if mama and them don't go. Go if you don't have the money for the business. Go if you don't have the financing for the loan. Go down there anyway. Somebody shout, I'm going to go anyway. Shout, I'm going to go anyway. I believe I got a church full of people that say, I'm going to go anyway. Rain, hail, sleet, snow, I'm going to go anyway. You got to say that in Washington. It may be a sunny day, it may be a rainy day, but I'm going to go anyway. So they go down there anyway. By the time they get there, they encounter these three surprises. But here's where we're after. First promise, and I'm done. <laughs> here's where we're going. And after the three surprises... <laughs> God has really been dealing with me. I'm telling you, God is going, I promise you, on the other side of the resurrection, there is going to be new life. I promise you. I didn't really recognize it until the media showed me our YouTube channel. And I said, oh, you guys are putting the whole service up. It says an hour and a half, an hour and 40, an hour and 24 minutes. And they said, no, that's just the message.
she tries to keep me on point down here. She tries. We're going to do better today. And so they go down. And after these surprises, an angel has a talk with them. And this is his question. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Glory to God. Why do you seek the living among the dead? And I know that these are angels speaking, but I, what I want you to see and know is we know that they are God's messengers. So although the words are coming out of their mouths, what I want you to see and hear that it is yet God speaking through them to his people. So although angels are saying the words, what I want you to hear is God asking the question, why do you seek the living among the dead? And when God asks a question, God is up to something. If I had time to do a series, I would just take you through the biggest questions in the Bible. God has a way of asking questions at the right place and at the right time to reveal things. When God asks a question, it is not because that he doesn't know. It is that he is trying to reveal something to you. It is like an elementary school teacher teaching a first grader arithmetic and she stands at the board, the whiteboard, the chalkboard, or the tablet today, and she says, what is two plus two? And it is not that the first grade teacher does not know, but she wants the student to be able to focus and answer the question of what is two plus two. So when God asks a question, it is not because she does not know. It is not because he does not know. But it is because he's trying to reveal something. And when God asks a question, it is to open our eyes. Adam, where are you? It's not that I don't know your location. You're hiding in the garden behind some trees naked. But where are you? I'm not asking for your locale. I'm asking so you can open your eyes and see what you've done and where you have fallen. Adam, where are you? Cain, where is your brother Abel? I know his location. I hear his blood crying out from the ground. So I know what you've done, but I'm giving you a chance. I'm opening the door for grace. So Cain, what have you done? Moses, what have I put in your hand? It's not that I don't know I've given you a rod, but I want you to reevaluate what I have already given you. And the answer for everything you need in the days and years ahead, I've already placed in your hand. So what have I put in your hand? Isaiah, whom shall I send? Glory to God. Ezekiel, can these bones live again? I know that I can breathe and move by my spirit, but I want to open your eyes to what I am able to do, and I want you to be an active participant. So I'm asking you, can these bones live again? Jonah, have you any right to be angry? Oh, y'all don't hear me here. I've got to get after this bitterness that's down on the inside of you, Jonah. Have you any right to be angry? Who do men say that I am? It's not that I don't know who I am. I know I'm the son of God. I know I am God incarnate. I know I am the Messiah sent to die for the sins of the world. But I need you to open your eyes to the revelation of who I am. So whom do men say that I am? And like them, he asks the question, why do you seek the living among the dead? And if you let me preach this thing this morning, just give me five to seven more minutes. I'll step on just one or two more toes and I'll be done. Why do we seek the living among the dead? I don't want to beat up on these ladies because you and I have the same problem. 
We are all have the tendency, we are all inclined to look for the living among the dead. If we truly be real, we all have a habit of looking for the living among the dead. If we be honest this morning, we've wasted a lot of years looking for the living. I wish I had time to talk among the dead. If I'll be real, I'd be about 12 years ahead of schedule if I wasn't looking for the living among the dead. See, you're not like me. I'm a little analytical. I did the math on my life, and I said if I would have done everything I was supposed to do at the right time, this would have been 12 years earlier. So I wasted 12 years looking for the living among the dead. And we stumble around in life cemeteries trying to find life in dead places. Looking for intimacy on Pornhub. Looking for sex in a strip club. Looking for self-esteem in degrees and knowledge and education. Looking to be who we are based on whom we marry. Y'all looking at me strange, but I am in the house. Pastor Gabriel, that seems so random. Why would you bring that up? There are more people watching porn than the four major sports combined. NFL, NBA, hockey, and major league, more watch porn than all four combined. Because we are looking for the living among the dead. And we seek life in things that don't matter, in things that are destined to die and fade away. Anything that won't last beyond this world is a dead thing. It's not a bad thing to have, but you just can't let it have you. Because you look for life among the dead. We stumble in bars looking for a mate, seeking life among the dead. We click on all types of apps and things looking for something, hoping we can find life <laughs> among the dead. I'm going to get to the good part in just a second. I just got to go through this valley of the shadow of death. But fear no evil. God is with you. Amen. Life among the dead. And like these ladies, we spend our time looking in the wrong places. Oh, my gosh. Help me, daughters, sons, please, brothers, sisters, anybody in the room, whatever you do, stop looking for life in dead places. I could never understand it, but I had to come into the revelation myself. So I recognize some are not going to listen. You're just going to have to experience it. When my parents used to say, the world has nothing to offer you. There's nothing that they can give you that's better than what God can give you. But we still waste years looking for life among the dead. So we think a certain number we can get to that we make every year will bring us life. We think a certain locale can bring us life. We think a certain area code to live in, a zip code to call home can give us life. We think a DR dot in front of our name can give us life. We think a PhD behind our name can give us life. And we put life in all of these things that are passing away. Heaven and earth will pass away. But he who does the will of God will live forever. I wish I had some First John Christians in the room. And these women go looking for life among the dead. And he asked them, why are you seeking the living among the dead? There are levels of questions any good teacher with a grain of salt knows what I'm talking about. There are levels of questions. There's what's called low-level questions. These are questions that require mere memory, just mere memory of the information. What is 2 plus 2? 4. Who is the president in 1900? Such and such. 
What happened? That's a low-level question. But when you get to a high-level question, a high-level question is meant to have the student analyze. A high-level question is meant to have the student engage in conversation so you can recognize that they don't have just mere memory of the information, but they can explain, they can converse about it, they can analyze it, they, they, they can turn it over, flip it and fold it. So this is not a low-level question, this is a high-level question. Then you have what's called convergent questions and divergent questions. Convergent questions are questions that only have one answer. Again, what's two plus two? Four. That's all there is. That's one answer to that question. Who was the president at that time? Such and such. That is one answer to that question. But a divergent question is a question that can have numerous answers. So what this angel on behalf of God is asking is he is asking a high level divergent question. A question that gets them to analyze where they are but it's a divergent question because the answer can be as different as many disciples there are standing there Mary why do you seek the living among the dead Mary Magdalene why do you seek the living among the dead well I just came down here to commemorate my Lord he cast seven devils out of me and I, I just thought it's the least I could do you why are you seeking the living among the dead. If I go throughout the room and we analyze all of our lives, all of us have something to some degree that we are seeking, assuming that it can bring life. So the answer is diverse. But I challenge you this morning, why do you seek the living among the dead? I'll say this and I'm done. Warning number two. He says to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? It was a high-level, divergent question meant to move them to see where they were, meant for them to analyze their lives and their thinking, but also it was a question of movement. It's a question of movement. It moves them from one train of thinking to another chain of thinking. It's meant to move them from one place to the next. Why do you seek the living among the dead? It's meant to move them from the crucifixion, watch me here, to the resurrection. It is not just a simple question that we read over and it's nothing. Why seek the living among the dead? It is just a simple question if you look at it at first glance, but it is a question that takes them out of Good Friday and ushers them into early Sunday morning. And I'm not asking you this question this morning to abuse or misuse you or put you on the spot, but I want this to be a question that chases you down all week because I want you to move out of the darkness of your life's Fridays and usher into the bright Sunday mornings of your life. Stop living in the crucifixion and get ready to step into the resurrection. I need somebody to high five a neighbor one more time and say neighbor this may be the last time I high five you but tell them get out of the crucifixion and move to the resurrection. Put me down there. Get out of the crucifixion and move me to the resurrection. Get out of the crucifixion and move me to the resurrection. I need somebody to step out of the Fridays and say, I'm getting ready to move to my life Sundays. So why seek ye the living among the dead? In their mind, they were doing what they thought was best. They are coming to honor a dead man, but they didn't know that Jesus was alive. So they're going down to an empty grave looking for somebody that they thought was dead, but yet and still they are alive. So this question moves them from the crucifixion over to the resurrection. This question moves them from one place to the next. It moves them from emotions and moves them into the truth of God's word. It moves them from death and it opens the door to life. It moves them from the depths of despair and opens the door to possibilities. It moves them from the failures of yesterday and opens their eyes to God's possibilities of tomorrow. Why seek ye the living among the dead? So that means that there is something that is yet still alive that I thought was dead. I want you to shake yourself and say self.
there is something that yet and still lives that you thought was dead there's a dream that you thought had died but yet and still it lives there's a goal that you thought you couldn't reach but yet and still it is possible I need somebody to help me preach I just need two or three people to join me in a praise party and say with God nothing shall be impossible I don't care how long it's been dead when God calls it back to life it shall live again I don't care how long it's been in the grave it yet shall live again my marriage has been in the grave for three days it's been buried and the tomb has been rolled over it but I declare why seek ye the living among the dead there is yet life springing up I declare a resurrection in every marriage a resurrection in every relationship my job seems dead there seems like there's no life there can be no possibility of promotion but I declare can oh glory to God can these bones live again why seek ye the living among the dead what you think is dead is not dead after all slap somebody one more time and say something is alive do you know it something is alive do you know it I don't this ain't for anybody this is just for me right now I'm preaching to myself can these bones live again son of man why seek ye the living among the dead there's something that's alive and you just don't know it I declare that your eyes shall be open to new possibilities this week I speak that your eyes shall be open to new avenues that God has for you I declare that your eyes shall be open to new ventures and opportunities that his light will shine on the kingdom and that you shall live and you shall not die I know that the tumor that you thought was malignant is not but why seek ye the living among the dead I don't care what the doctor says he rose with all power in his hand Holy Ghost power, healing power, saving power, keeping power. I'm getting ready for you to wake up in just a moment. But God told me to preach this thing till I feel it for myself. So whether you shout or not, that's fine. I got to preach to myself. Why seek ye the living among the dead? There's something that's getting ready to happen and take place this question it moves them from one place to the next this question it moves them from death to life this question it moves them from the crucifixion to the resurrection but what this question does is this question opens the door to a brand new revelation the reason why people can shout on Easter Sunday morning, the reason why they think I'm just being emotional, the reason why that people don't quite celebrate like I celebrate, it's not the same for everybody, but you gotta celebrate in some kind of way, it's because you don't recognize what the resurrection of Jesus means for you because he got up you can get up I wish I had some Ephesians 2 6 Christians because we have been raised with Christ and we are seated with him in the heavenly realms I wish I had some Colossians 3 Christians and Christ has raised us up with him turn to that neighbor one more time I think this is about the sixth or the seventh time. Seventh is the number of completion. And tell that neighbor, neighbor, this is the last time I'm going to bother you. Better yet, maybe not. But God told me to tell you, 
get up out of that grave. I don't care how long you've been down. Get up out of that grave. Grab that neighbor's hand and pull him up out of that seat and say, I'm yanking you up out of that grave. I'm yanking you up out of that grave. The tomb has been opened. There's no opportunity like the present. Walk in what God has over your life. Tell him because he got up, I can get up and I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I need somebody in the room to testify with me. I'm almost done. But when I think about the resurrection, I think about Jesus rising with all power in his hands. But when Lazarus got up, Jesus said, take the grave clothes from off of Lazarus. I need you to go to somebody about three rows away and tell them, excuse me, just take off my grave clothes. What you thought was dead, yet and still lives. I need you to go to that person and just say, take off my clothes. I said, go to that person. Go to that person. Tell them, take off my clothes. Take off my grave clothes. These are dead man clothes. I wear the clothes of a living man. I wear the clothes. Take them off, take them off. And some of you here, I know when I'm in the house, the tomb is open, but you're choosing to stay in your grave clothes. There is no opportunity like the present. Take off what is meant for a dead man. It's not meant for you. You're not supposed to be there. I'll call you out of the grave. Oh, y'all don't hear me. I'll call you out of the club. I'll call you out of the joint. I'll call you out of the crib. I'll call you out. He ain't your husband. Get out of his bed. Get out of the grave. your wife get out of the grave it's killing you can't you see it and I challenge I fought it back but I just gotta speak what God tells me to say I wanted to speak something nice and positive, but some of y'all, I know I've seen you around. I'll call you out of the grave. Get your behind in church. It makes no sense that a church is packed on Easter and the following Sunday you can't find nobody. Get out the grave. Now, if you want to go somewhere with a religious tradition, God bless you. We won't see you next year for Easter. But somebody who's been blood washed, water baptized, and say, I want to step out of what I was in and step into what God has for me. Many of you who know me know I'm not a quote-unquote fire and brimstone preacher. 
But at the same time, I got to speak when I get a sense that God is saying, why are you constantly seeking the living among the dead? And for whatever reason, I'm not to put anybody on, on point, but I'm just getting this drawn to this section. That's why I keep saying it. God wants your attention. Why are you seeking the living among the dead? It's time for you to come out. You have no place there. You don't belong there. Christ has raised you up and seated you in heavenly places. You have children following you. Live for him. Die for him. Walk for him. Talk for him. Don't you see everything in this world is dying behind you? Economic systems are dying. The U.S. dollar is dying. Everything is fading away. Everything we put our trust in that we call life, God is shaking the systems of our world. And yet and still, we go to life's graveyards thinking that we'll find answers there. But I'm telling you, that's the wrong place to look. If you're looking for joy, you won't find it out there. That's the wrong place to look. If you're looking for comfort, you won't find it out there. That's the wrong place to look. If you're looking for peace, it won't be in a bottle of liquor, a bottle of wine, a joint, a blunt, I promise you. If you're looking for identity, you won't find it in a BBL. You won't find it in, in fake breasts. You won't find it on social media. You won't find it in likes and followers. None of it matters. And we waste our time with things that don't matter. And we come into a revelation at 60, talking about God, use me now. Well, I guess I can. We waste years in dead places. I'm called into the ministry at 65. Well, okay. God says, serve the Lord in the days of thy youth. He can use anybody, any age, any time. But what the Bible is trying to say, as soon as you come into an understanding of what Christ has done for you, serve him now. If you're coming here to look for perfection, I won't just talk about out there, I'll talk about in here. You won't find what you're looking for. If you're coming to me to find a God, you won't find what you're looking for. I'll fail you almost every time. But if you come to God truly seeking him, he says, you'll find what you're looking for. This is why he doesn't just reveal himself to anybody. He reveals those who diligently seek him. He's not going to waste his time for somebody to say, show me and I'll believe. He says, I'm going to, if you really seek after me, if you're really serious about it, I'll reward those who diligently seek me. You'll seek me how? When, when, when will I find you, God? When you, when you seek me with all your heart. When I know you really want me, you really want to find me. I'll reveal myself to you. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for hiding it in our hearts. Father, I thank you for opening our eyes and letting us know that's the wrong place to look. We've looked at so many places. Even me, Father, even now, you write this as an eye-opening experience for me. That I've wasted time and years looking in the wrong places for things. But Father, thank you that you love us so much that you have God encounters while we are yet looking for the wrong thing. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I pray that these people under the sound of my voice, that as they leave this place today and go to their various destinations, 
that this word would not escape them, that they would not go back to the mundane, ordinary, dead, lifeless experiences that they have, but they would walk in the resurrection power that you have for them. Father, we love you. We thank you and we praise you. In your son, the Christ's name, amen. Give me a few more moments as you keep those heads bowed and those eyes closed for just a minute. Thank you for your patience. I believe this is a unique experience unlike any other. The church is praying now. All of this means nothing if you don't make a decision. There's nothing fancy, really. I mean, God gives us revelation and God shines light on his word. But there's really nothing fancy about what I have to say. Like I said initially, it's the same story. Jesus loves you. God loves you, sent his son Jesus, died on the cross for the wrongdoings of all mankind. And he rose from the dead. All you have to do now is make a decision. A decision to turn from your way of doing things and turn towards God's way. It's just a decision. It's the biggest decision of your life. So I don't want to downplay it. But it's nothing more, nothing less than a decision. You just have to decide. There's no tricks. There's no special words I could say. You just need to decide. And I'm just getting this sense this morning with the tone I'm kind of taking that I'm talking to some people who've heard before and who know. You just need to decide. You know enough to make a decision. You just need to decide. There's no more convincing that you need. Just make the decision and walk in it. Make Jesus Lord of your life. Recognize that he died on the cross for your sins and he rose from the dead. That's what this weekend is all about. If you're here and you're one or two places, one or two or maybe three places, you're outside of relationship with Jesus Christ or you're outside of relationship with the local church. And you say, Pastor Gabriel, church today, I heard the message. And I want to begin to walk into life. I don't want to hang around dead places any longer. So today I want to make a decision to live a life that's pleasing to God. I want to begin to look in the right places. If that's you, will you shoot your hand up in the air wherever you are? While these heads are bowed, these eyes are closed. Thank you. While these heads are bowed and these eyes are closed, shoot those hands up in the air. There's no point in coming if we're not going to make a decision. I see you, brother. I see you, brother. I see you, brother. Oh, okay. Shoot that hand up in the air. There's no point in coming if we're not going to decide. I see you, brother. coming. Thank you. Hey, friends. You're coming. Good to see you, my friend. We won't embarrass you. Some are coming. But shoot that hand up wherever you are. Keep these heads bowed and these eyes closed. Let the church be praying now. People are wavering between two opinions. How long will you waver? Glory to God. I love it when everybody comes, when anybody comes. They could face me, but I'm seeing men come. Glory to God. They could face me. Anybody can come, but I'm seeing men come. Thank you, Jesus. Young men, older men. The wrong place to look. Today, Pastor Gabriel, I want to make a decision for Christ Jesus. If that's you, shoot your hand up in the air wherever you are. If you see the hand, go to the person. 
Thank you. I see you. Thank you. You got him. This. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There's no point in coming without a decision. Hallelujah. Make a decision. Make a decision. I got to do something different. I can't live how I used to live. I can't do what I used to do. And I'm not, I'm not preaching moralism and perfection. But what I'm saying is, the fruit of your heart will be, I want to live in a way that's pleasing to God. That's one of the telltale signs to show that you belong to him. You want to live in a way that pleases him. It bothers you to live any way you want. You want to live in a way that's pleasing to his spirit. So you want him in your life. If that's you, I'll take a few more moments. And some of these people, we can get their information, but some need more than just information. They need ministry. Tears are flooding these two's eyes. Hallelujah. Oh, I feel good. We got people down here getting saved, y'all. I feel good. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 
Somebody went from spiritual death to spiritual life. Somebody went from the grave to the resurrection. Somebody was dead, but yet they now live. Hallelujah. We'll take just a few more moments. Give them just a little more time. If you could just be patient with us. We appreciate your patience. I want to keep these doors open. Somebody here, perhaps you're still trying to decide. Wherever you are, the doors are still open. Come on. It's never too late. I can't think of a better day. Easter 2023, the year that you gave your life to Christ. The day that you gave your life to Christ. Let this be the day. Let this be the day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Apostle. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Why don't you join me on your feet? Let's give God praise for all that he's done and all that he is yet going to do. We'll give them a few more moments. And listen, we... Um, when we preach, and I'll say this and we'll get to the benediction. When we preach, we get uh, emotional and things don't always come out right. But what I want you to hear is the passion behind what I believe God has given me to say. And for some of you in this room, I'm going to just be real. It's time out for just the running and going, coming when we want. Now, I know how this goes. I'm an I'm a honest preacher. I know how the game goes. Some of you I won't see till next Christmas, till Christmas. We call them CME Christians, Christmas, Mother's Day, and Easter. But sooner or later, you're going to have to come to a recognition that a little dab just won't do. And it's about living a life devoted to God. So I challenged that person today who had no plans of coming next week. <laughs> Let this be the beginning of your turnaround. We're not interested in a crowd and getting a mega church. Or anything. God blesses churches to be large. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying we're not just in it to try to build a crowd. We care about people. And I want you to do good and have good jobs, your children to prosper, do well financially, economically, all those things, do well in your relationships. But above all that, I know what's most important is your relationship with Jesus. And so before I just say the benediction, I just want to challenge you, live for God. Love God. It doesn't mean we'll be perfect. I mess up more than anybody in here probably. I'm going to go repent for some of the things I said this morning. It's not about perfection, but what you're saying is, God, I desire to live a life pleasing to you. I want to turn my family in the right direction. Man, I'm calling on you. I want to turn my wife, my family. Around. You should hear the statistics of how families go to God and stick with God if the man makes the decision to live for God. Women are good, that's great, but you should just hear the statistics on the power of a man. There are even statistics that say a single father is better than a single mother just because the power that God has given and the authority and the headship that God has given to me. Men, we need to see you. Women love God, that's great, but men, this is your time. Our world is void of leaders, real spirit-led leaders. 
So as you leave today, I pray that God would bless you and your family with a wonderful Easter and Resurrection Sunday. We'll be here next Sunday morning uh, at 10 a.m. Join us online. We have classes and small groups. Go to our website to find out a little about us. I'll be around for, for a little bit after this, so come and say hello to me, Apostle and Lady Madison, the whole team, and just get to know us. We're an imperfect bunch, but we love God. And so we just love to meet you for a moment, hang out. Uh, say hello but if you're going with your family your loved ones whatever you do today and this week recognize God loves you he's always with you he'll never leave you and he'll never forsake you may he bless you with his power and his authority on resurrection Sunday unto him who's able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before his presence to the only wise God our father be glory honor dominion and power both now and forevermore let all of God's people shout amen amen amen